there's a trick that everybody's been talking about, and the trick was revealed in an email to hide the decline, giving an impression that something underhand had taken place in climate science. Rarely has an area of science and its relationship with the world come under such intense scrutiny. Three inquiries focused on the team at the University of East Anglia's Climatic Research Unit, CRU. One by MPs, one on the science, and today's on how the scientists handled data and presented their results. Broadly, all dismissed suggestions that the thousand-odd emails released onto the Internet showed scientists had manipulated data to exaggerate the evidence on climate change. There's a body of opinion which no evidence will convince because they think there's a world conspiracy involving all countries. But there's another body of opinion that really, you know, is anxious to be sure there isn't just some sort of collective think. I think for the latter, this review and its complete exoneration of the honesty and integrity of our scientists will be highly significant. But today's inquiry did find the scientists had consistently failed to be sufficiently open, and its potentially most damaging conclusion concerned a graph that has gained iconic status in climate science. That graph was discussed in the much-mentioned email which talked of a trick to hide the decline. The inquiry found there was nothing wrong in splicing different sets of data to produce the graph, and that there was no intent to mislead. But they said the outcome was misleading and that the scientists should have been more clear about what they've done. The graph is a hockey stick graph. There's been a long argument for 10 years about that. I don't think it will cause further damage, but it underlines that the scientists' claims that they were holier than vow on the public presentation of their science doesn't really hold water. Sometimes they've simply tried to oversimplify things and have lost, lost I think, our confidence because of that. And the sceptics have been quite right to point out that they've rather covered up some of the uncertainties in their research. This man runs a website which critiques methods used in climate science. He fervently pursued the release of data from CRU and he says today's inquiry was flawed. They don't help themselves by doing inquiries that don't talk to both sides. So the, all that does is, is make things linger. And they did not interview any uh, CRU critics. Steve McIntyre wasn't the only person who requested data. Another critic learned today that data he asked for should have been released in a ruling by the Information Commissioner's Office. I think the most important lesson is, is as with all laws, uh, I mean, you, you can run but you can't hide, that, that, that this, is a, this is a new regime. It, it, it came in in 2004. It's taken a while for people to get the hang of it. But the, the Freedom of Information Act, and more importantly, the, the, the Environmental Information Regulations, really are uh, the law, and you have to disclose the information you have to disclose. And another key finding in today's report, if scientists use computer software, they should release their source code as well as their raw data. Ten years ago, most academics were fairly lax about issuing their data and software, including myself. But now that we've got the World Wide Web, we've got the Internet, and we've got mass communication networks, it allows us to put the data on a server, a computer, and then uh, put our software on the server, and anybody, anywhere in the world can access it. Anybody in our community, anybody outside the community can access all that software and data. Once all those emails and documents have been put online, the scrutiny went further, out to the IPCC, the international body that advises governments on climate science. And what that scrutiny found is a series of embarrassing errors, some more serious than others. First, errors over when the Himalayan glaciers might disappear. Then, talk of risks to the Amazon rainforest, citing only an environmental group. Then this week, discussions in the Dutch Parliament over just how much of the country might be at risk of flooding and a tendency by the IPCC to emphasise the negative impacts of climate change. And questions over uncertainty in estimates of how many people might be affected by drought in Africa. There's little doubt that the IPCC will have to change. The climate science community was very deeply unsettled uh, by the public reaction to the emails and, and I think there's been a lot of soul-searching 
over recent months uh, and I think I can begin to see already reactions from the community to the emails in terms of uh, greater uh, openness uh, with data, uh, new initiatives to make data publicly and more freely available and also uh, more explicit attention being paid uh, to the uncertainties of, of climate science as well as the certainties when we communicate with the public. I don't think the IPCC will ever be seen in the same way again by the public. It's no longer the oracle. We now understand, and I think it's perfectly healthy for us to understand, that scientists make mistakes, that scientists can mislead people, that scientists are, are vulnerable to all the sort of personal frailties that we all are. We should stop seeing scientists as just kind of oracles of these things. So um, the IPCC is undergoing an, a process of internal review now to see if it can be more open in its processes. And some of the emails reveal ra in rather scary ways, I think, how scientists got round the existing processes. The fallout from this row won't go away, and damage to the reputation of climate science may yet extend to the global political discussion about what to do about climate change too. Susan Watts, I'm joined by Ivo de Boer, who led the UN negotiations on climate change till a week ago, by the former Chancellor, Lord Lawson, uh, of the Global Warming Policy Foundation, a group who campaign against what they say is the domination of the climate change debate by those who believe strongly in its existence, and by Bob Watson, Chief Scientific Advisor at the Department of Environment, who also worked with the UN panel on climate change. Lord Lawson, you heard there in that report the Vice Chancellor of uh, the University saying it was a complete exoneration of the scientists involved. Do, do you accept that? No, of course not. Uh, and you've already had a number of things on the program already that have shown that there are a lot of things that went wrong. Uh, and uh, the matter is not over. I am quite sure that the scientists believed that when they were being secretive, when they were manipulating a, gra a key graph and chart in a way that they shouldn't have done. And that's, that's uh, hugely important in your view, that it graph. It is hugely right. important. I'm quite sure that they were motivated by the fact that they thought this was an important cause they were pursuing. But they did not behave in an appropriate manner. Yeah, they behave in a disreputable like, manner. But, but you make it sound like a religion. They believe in the them. cause. It is for them. And that is one of the things that I'm opposed <coughs> to. I think we need to look objectively, not merely at the science, which, is, which is, has a number of uncertainties. There are some things which are clear, but there are a number of things also that are uncertain. But also, what are the impacts? And you heard already about the Dutch finding, the Dutch Environmental Council finding that the, the IPCC have had a, produced a very unbalanced account of the impacts. And finally, there's the question of the policy. You mentioned I'm chairman of the Global Warming Policy Foundation. The policy is, is in the name because this decarbonisation policy, which the world is officially on, I don't think it's going to happen, but the world is officially on that track, simply does not make economic sense. Do you, do you accept that this has been, even though the scientists have been you know, called honest and rigorous and so on, this has actually been quite disastrous for their campaign because it casts huge doubts which people still talk about. They talk about it in the pubs, they talk about it in newspapers, and they talk about it in learned journals too. The first thing which is very important is not only this report but Lord Oxford's report, the House of Commons report, all stated there is no reason to question the science. Not only is the integrity of these scientists completely honest, but also their data is honest and they did not in any way adversely influence IPCC. But they did that in very fact, unwisely, but did they not? They should have had more openness and transparency in their data and in their computer codes. Uh, there's no question whatsoever. And it has indeed had damage in the way it's been portrayed to the public. And we have to regain the trust. We have to make sure the public understand what do we know where are the uncertainties and what the implications are of what we know and where the uncertainties but you, are. But you 